Lord. For a moment, I want you to try to put yourself in, um, in Mary's sandals, if you could. Try to, to picture what it must have been like for Mary. A young woman, maybe a teenager, many people believe that she was a teenager because in, in those days, according to their customs, uh, you probably were, uh, you, you usually got married in your teens. So she was unmarried, so she's probably a teenager. She's pregnant and she doesn't have a husband. And in those days, according to, to God's law, according to the, the civil law, um, being pregnant outside of wedlock was punishable by stoning. Um, and she doesn't have a husband yet. How is she going to convince her husband um, to marry her? So just kind of think about that situation that Mary was in. Try to empathize with her. What are some of the feelings that are rolling around in your tummy right now? Anxiety? Worry? Fear? How is this all going to work out? But is that what we see in Mary? Do we see her full of worry, full of restlessness? No, we don't. And why is that? How could, how could Mary not be full of worry and fear and restlessness? Because it all depends on who she worshipped. Um, who you worship or what you worship means everything. Means everything. Um, Augustine, the, the great church father, uh, lived about 400 A.D., and he says in the opening of his book called The Confessions, kind of an autobiography, he came to faith later on in life and uh, was a very rebellious, crazy uh, young man and came to faith later on. And, and he looked back on his life and he said, O oh Lord, our hearts are restless until we rest in you. Right? That, that Augustine was saying, it's all about our hearts. It's all about what we worship. It's all about what we, what we long for, what we worship. Um, I was reading a blog earlier, and uh, James Hine, a, a pastor in Rochester, a Lutheran pastor in Rochester, and he, he said in there that, that, that more than anything else in your life, what you worship um, is, is, is the most important. It, everything you are is a product of your worship life. And I think he's right. And that's what Augustine was saying also. That, that whatever you worship really determines more things in your life than anything else. Uh, more than what you think about, more than anything else going on in your life. What you worship, not necessarily what you think about or even what you believe about things, but what you worship changes everything. And that's why Mary was not restless, that she could rest in the Lord, because it all depends on who she worshipped. See, Mary, in the middle of all of this very difficult situation, um, Mary was caught up in the wonder of God. Mary was caught up in the wonder of God's plan. Mary looked at God as being very big, and she knew she was very small. Listen to this song, the spontaneous song of praise that Mary sings. She begins by saying, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is His name. As Mary looked at herself, she saw herself as very small. And she looked at God as being very big. Uh, when she says, uh, my soul glorifies the Lord, it's a word that means magnify. That's why it's called the Magnificat, right? She magnified God. She looked at God and said, God, you are amazing. You are big. 
And, and what was the first thing that led her to worship the Lord? She says, my, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary knew that she was sinful. Mary knew that she needed to be rescued. And in the Lord, she had a rescuer. Mary had a, a, a Savior, that she was a forgiven child of God, and that led her to worship. And then she also saw the other things that God was doing. She says, the Lord has done great things for me. The Mighty One has done great things for me. You think about all the things that he had done, putting this, this baby miraculously in her tummy, that, that the promise of the Messiah was being fulfilled in her. And she looked at the wonder of God, and she was not distracted by the worries of, the, of her life because she was caught up in worshiping a big God. And if she had a big God, he could take care of everything in her life. And, and worship changed everything for her. Now, what about us? Who or what do you worship? Now, Maybe, you know, all of us would say, well, uh, pastor, I, you know, I want to worship God. And, and we'd all say that, right? I want to worship Jesus. I want him to be first in my life. I, you know, worship means the thing you get excited about, the thing you get passionate about, right? The thing that the, your God, your, the, the thing that you worship is the thing that your mind goes to when you have nothing else to think about, Right? The thing that, that you think about when there's nothing else to think about. The thing that you run to and rescue. The thing that you enjoy spontaneously. And we would say, well, I would like myself to spontaneously rejoice in God, to be full of prayer and worship and music in my heart. But, but pastor, I, I just can't see God. I need something more tangible. And so, so very ha happens in my life and our life is what we really worship well, maybe we worship sports, right? Like, if someone gave us tickets to that game right now, we are so passionate about sports. We would be there tomorrow because that's, that's what we enjoy. We love it. We worship it. We want to we go and see that thing. Or, or maybe we worship our career, right? All these things are good things. They're not bad things, but you can wake up in the morning and say, I can't wait to get to work because I just feel like I'm getting ahead. I feel like I'm making progress. I feel like I'm moving forward. And you get excited about it. You get passionate about it. Or maybe you're excited about Christmas because that means you get to be with family and you love your family. It's what you're passionate about. It's what your heart naturally is drawn to. Or, you know, just to see your own progression, worshiping yourself. You just like to be able to, I love to be able to kind of put things in order and I feel like I'm moving, getting progress in my life. Now, it's not necessarily wrong to be passionate about those things. But when those secondary things become ultimate things and that's where we go, that's what our ultimate passion is about, like when we're, that's the only thing we think about, that's the only thing we run to, those things will one day eat us up. Because every one of them has a limit. Um, sports are great, right? But after a while, we realize that that joy is over. The, the, the season ends, right? The Super Bowl's over. The, the game is over. Our time of playing those sports are over. Our career, we could be fired just like that. We, it, it can end, right? Our spouse or family, one day we either, we will look at them in a casket or they will look at us in a casket. Something will happen, right? That that is not the ultimate source of salvation, of meaning, of of, of importance in our life or, or family or, or money or entertainment. All these are good things, but if, that, if that's what you're passionate about, right? The only thing that your mind runs to, the only time that, that, that they have nothing else to think about, um, one day those things will cause us great difficulty, right? Those things will eat us alive. Those things, because they can't deliver, will ultimately lead us to, to more worry, more anxiety, and ultimately can push God out of our lives. And so how can, how can we be swept up into this kind of spontaneous worship ab with, about God? How does this happen? 
How, how does God become wonderful to us, right? Not just our, our, our tradition of coming to church when we, but how do we get swept up in the wonder of God? I was reading today. Do I have the quote here still? Yes, I do. Martin Luther, he, he uh, wrote a commentary on the Magnificat, and this is what he says. He says, um, what Mary is experiencing, what Mary is saying, he's saying, this is the experience of all those who are saturated with the divine sweetness and spirit. They cannot find words to utter that what, uh, what they feel. For to praise the Lord with gladness is not the work of man. It is rather a joyful suffering and the work of God alone. It cannot be taught in words, but must be learned in one's own experience. So I can't make you passionate about God. And you can't make me passionate about God. Right? I can't, I can't force feed you to, to, to just be passionate about God, to be as excited about God as that you're excited about everything else. And, and you can't do that for me either. Uh, Martin Luther says this comes by the work of God through life experience. That's what L Luther said. And Mary actually kind of goes into how God usually works in our lives. Listen to the next section of her song. Verse 50. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but the rich he has sent away empty. Do, do you see this kind of back and forth that, that Mary is saying? She says, those who are mighty and strong are brought down. Those who are full of pride are brought down. Those who are rulers are brought down. Those who are rich are sent away empty. Now, why does that happen? What is, why does God do that? God often takes away those things that we trust in, that we are passionate about, to show us that they can't be the ultimate things in our lives. That they can't fulfill our deepest desires. They're not wrong, but they just can't deliver. Our, our, our families, as good as they are, they can't deliver our deepest desires. They can't give us our full identity. Our careers, our, our, our jobs, our hobbies, those things are all good, but they can't answer our deepest need. And very often, God takes away those riches. God takes away our things that we're prideful about. God brings us down. Why? so that he can lift up the humble, so he can fill us with good things, so he can give us what really matters. I'm going to talk more about this on Sunday, but I just have not seen anyone who is passionate about God who has not suffered. Think about the people you know who are really passionate about God. Aren't those the people who have suffered the most? Right? The people who have, have, have seen the end of, of this life, the ones who see how empty so many things are, as good as they are, they are empty shells, they are temporary, they can't deliver. You know, all of us, I mean, me included, pastors, I think, are, are, I've talked about this quite a bit, our, our temptation is to think that building a big church, being recognized, being known as a great pastor will give us... A, answers to our deepest desires. Even being a good pastor can't fulfill that. All right? That can be an idol too. So very often pastors, we, we, we suffer or, or things go bad or churches go wrong or things like that. So we realize even having a great church can't fulfill my deepest desires. So bringing us down, humbling us so that he can fill us with good things, so that he can give us what we deeply desire. And when I'm around people who, who suffer, those people are usually the ones who say, I've seen the secret. I've seen how wonderful God is. He stripped away all of the chaff, and I can look at God and see the wonder of who God is, the, the, the love he has, the depth of his power, the, 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 the stability of his presence. 
the, the joy of his comfort, of his gospel. And very often when those things are stripped away, we begin to spontaneously worship God. When we see that God meets us in our deepest need with his grace, he becomes wonderful to us. He becomes majestic and we sing with Mary. And and that's how Mary closes this. In the last verse here, verse 54, he says, He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary is searching back, her her song ends, searching all the way back 2,100 years before uh, before her day. 2,100 years before Mary was Abraham. And God chose Abraham and said, Abraham, through your nation, through the Hebrews, in the land of Canaan, through all of your uh, descendants, which will be as many as the stars in the sky, through, through all of that, I'm going to bless all nations. And so for over 2,000 years, God kept that promise, using thousands and hundreds of thousands of people to complete his plan to bring the Messiah into the world. And Mary looks at that glorious plan and she realizes, I'm just a pawn in that great plan. I'm just, I'm just a one little pawn in the great plan of God. And God's story is magnificent. Have you looked at the wonder of God's plan? That he has orchestrated all of history, all of humanity, all of creation. He's done all things to rescue you. Um, Think about this Christmas season. Um, how many of you have your Christmas shopping done? You don't have to raise your hands, but I can tell in the look of your faces, not everyone does. I don't either. But um, you, you think about Christmas shopping, and, and why do we do it, right? I mean, the, the other person could buy the gift. In fact, many times, right, they give you the list, like, here's what it is. Go and buy this for me, right? And, and, and they could buy the gift for themselves, but why do we do it? Because going, uh, going to the store, buying them the gift, taking time out of our day, it's, it's showing the other person, you're worth that time to me, right? You're worth, you're worth going to get that. Um, you, you mean a lot to me, and I, I, you know, I, I want to take time to do that. Now, now think about God. He didn't just take a day off to rescue you. He has taken all of history, this magnificent drama of history since the beginning of the world, since the fall of Adam and Eve, to orchestrate all of history, the last 6,000 years, to rescue you. I mean, isn't that wonderful? I mean, that's just like make you want to worship him and, and be caught up in this magnificent plan. I mean, Of course I want to be in worship. Of course I want to come to Advent service. Of course I want to sing his praise. Of course I want to read my Bible. Of course I want to think about him. He's been spending history thinking about me. And so who you worship, what you're passionate about, will change everything. My prayer is that as passionate as you are about sports, which is a good thing, right? As excited as you get about that game, about game day and and clearing the house and let me watch the game, as excited as you get about that, I would pray that you would be just as excited and even more about the love of God. As excited as you get about your career and where things are going in your life, that you get up and hit the feet running and you're ready to go to work, um, that you would be excited about your Savior even more, the love of God. As excited and passionate you are for your family, that you would do anything for your family because you love them and you're passionate about them. As passionate as you are with your family, I pray that that you would see the love of God and be just as passionate even more. Because that's the answer. All those other things are good, but they won't take away your deepest fears and worries. 
All those things are good, but they can't rescue you from sin and death and guilt and shame. They're just, at best, a distraction. They're good things, but they can't fulfill your deepest needs. And when you stand before God like Mary did, and you realize in my humble state, in my sinful state, as Mary said, God is my Savior. He searched me out. When you're confronted with the love and wonder of God, well, we will join her song. My spirit, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has done wonderful things for me. Amen. Please stand.